I'm starting off. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for giving us your time and talent. Um, my name is Bill Hain uh, uh, from District 56, and I'm chairman of the Downstate Caucus of the Senate Democrats. And we're here to discuss a educational reform bill having to do with how money is allocated to our public schools, K through 12, which couldn't be more timely and it's long overdue. Um, the sponsor, the chief sponsor of the bill, a, a person who's been working on this for several years, is Senator Andy Menar of Bunker Hill. Um, as you know, he was chief of staff. He was our budget director, if anyone in the Senate or in the General Assembly knows about budgets and money and the allocation of those for educational purposes, it's Senator Andy Menar. He's without peer in that regard. So I would start off by introducing everyone. You know everyone here, I presume. Um, and I want to start off by introducing Senator Andy Menar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Hain, uh, who chairs our downstate caucus in the Senate. Um, Last week, uh, we took steps forward uh, to advance legislation to uh, fix what I think we all know is a broken system. Uh, we as downstate members uh, in the Senate understand this uh, full well. Uh, we've seen an erosion over time of resources uh, being allocated to school districts downstate, uh, which has resulted in a set of circumstances in downstate districts uh, not just ones that we represent, but also districts that our Republican colleagues represent. A set of circumstances that I don't think any parent in the state, regardless of uh, where they live, would be proud of. Uh, we have a piece of legislation that's advancing through the Senate, Senate Bill 231, that would fix these problems. Uh, not overnight, uh, but over time. It's a step in the right direction. Uh, we thought it was important, uh, given much of the rhetoric that's coming from the governor, uh, that's based on geographic differences in the state, uh, to uh, talk about this issue today as we start off the week of session um, and to address some of the concerns that the governor has brought up. Um, let's start with uh, the idea uh, that the current funding formula was uh, created by Democrats. Uh, we should remind ourselves that the current funding formula was uh, passed and signed into law by Governor Edgar. Uh, we're coming up on 20 years now. Absent of change, we will pass that 20-year mark uh, next year. Uh, the formula today was created by a House of Representatives that was controlled by Democrats and a Senate that was controlled by Republicans. And there's been little change to that formula since 1997. That's something the governor has just been flat out wrong on every time he says that. Uh, number two, um, the governor seeks to divide the state when it comes to geography, uh, which is an inherent challenge, not just to this issue, but to multiple issues that we face as a legislative branch of government. Um, there should be no issue that unites downstate Democrats and Republicans more than school funding. Uh, there's a belief today, and I respect my Republican colleagues greatly, worked with many of them through the details of this issue for, for two years. Uh, but there's this belief that somehow uh, the districts that downstate Democrats represent fare better in the bill than districts that downstate Republicans represent. And I want to be clear that that is not the case. Uh, the district uh, that our Republicans' colleagues represent fare well under this bill, fare much better under this bill than the proposal that Governor Rauner has put forward as an alternative for the coming fiscal year. So this idea that somehow our districts um, as Democrats fare better than our Republican colleagues downstate is just simple, it's simple nonsense. Um, Senator Luchtefeld's district, for example, who I have the utmost respect for, served on the EFAC committee, uh, was the co-chair, uh, participated in, in those hearings, gave his, uh, you know, his ideas, put them on the table. Um, his district fares just as well as my district uh, because we both serve school districts that uh, service and educate poor children in rural areas. Um, that's something that we have to talk about as downstaters. That's another thing that we want to mention today. And then finally, um, you know, the governor has uh, proposed uh, a budget, not a plan. He uses the word plan, which is a stretch. 
uh, but he's proposed a budget that fully funds a foundation level that at this point in time is a complete fictional number. Um, by fully funding the foundation level, putting $55 million more into the system that we have today, um, that earns us as downstaters less money for our schools. So the governor's asking us to put money into a broken system, a system that he himself admits is completely flawed, that needs to be changed. But he's asking us as members uh, to devote more resources during difficult budget times into a system that will earn our districts less, which is a continuation of the status quo, uh, which, you know, when you, when you take off the varnish, you peel back the layers, that's what the governor's asking for, is a continuation of the status quo. And that status quo over the past decade has put downstate school districts at a complete disadvantage. And it's time for Democrats and Republicans downstate in the Senate to work together to end that once and for all. Next up, Senator Stadelman, Rockford. Thanks, Senator Minara. I am uh, Senator Steve Stadelman. I represent the 34th District, which includes the Rockford School District. I believe uh, the Rockford School District is a textbook example of what's wrong with our current system and why there needs to be reforms. The district has a high number of uh, poor students. I believe the number of low-income students is, is at 80% of the population of, in the Rockford School District. And we also have low property values and declining property values. In fact, the value of the tax base currently is the same as it was back in 2001. So there's been inflation, obviously costs have increased for local school districts, but the school district is dealing with property tax values, a base that's equivalent to back in 2001. Rockford residents just received their tax bills in the past week or two. The property tax rate for most Rockford residents is now over 15%. And more than half of that goes for the Rockford School District. And I don't think people get the connection that one reason, a big reason why local property tax rates in Rockford or wherever are so high is because of how the state funds education K through 12. It's not like, uh, you know, taxpayers are unhappy, but they need to, to figure out the connection. Um, it's not because the district has been overspending. In fact, the district's tax levy the past four years, the amount of money at Science for Education has been flat. But over that period, the tax rate has increased two and a half dollars. So it just shows you the inequities of the system and how declining property values make it very difficult for districts like Rockford to try to generate the local resources needed to provide a quality education. To explain it another way, there are some districts in the state that will spend twice as much money per pupil than Rockford school districts do, but their tax rates are less than half of the Rockford tax rate. Again, that shows the inherent inequity of our current funding system that d depends so heavily on, on property tax dollars. The quality of a child's education should not depend on the value of properties in that neighborhood. You know, Rockford schools have significant needs. I mentioned 80% are low income, 25% uh, use English as a second language or special education programs. But you know, communities with a low number of, uh, a high number of low income students need to invest in education the most, but they're the least equipped to do so. You know, this is an economic development issue. Uh, talk to businesses throughout the Rockford area. Their biggest concern is workforce development, having trained quality workers. And if we don't address this issue, that's going to make us less competitive as a state and as a community in the long run. You know, unfortunate, it's become, as Senator Menard mentioned, it's become a political football. The issue isn't and should not be Chicago versus the rest of the state. The issue is students all across the state who are low income, who have significant needs, and should have the adequate uh, resources they deserve. Thank you, Senator Bernard. We appreciate what you've done, the hard work. You worked as hard as anybody I've ever seen up there. Uh, Gary Forby, 59th District, got the bottom 13 counties. It's all about kids, what we're here today. And what I like about today is we're talking about, with Andy coming in, we're talking about figures. You know, normally when I get up to see somebody give a speech or something, they, say, they always talk about stuff. You know, the words don't mean nothing to me. Our budget don't need nothing to words to me. I want to see figures. Andy put the figures out there. So I think that's what's very important about this. You know, uh, my district, 95% of my district gets, gets more money. Uh, third, uh, there was 27,000 students will be an increase. Nobody will get below zero. Uh, 1,300 students will get the same amount. 
You know, on TV the, the other night, they're talking about a little town called Joppa. Joppa uh, School District said, I can't do this. So I, I mean, I'm not taking a beating that's wrong. Well, the figures is wrong. The figures is right today. With the governor's figures, Joppa would get $5,000 less. Less money, what the governor wants to do. In Andy's figures, they're going to get $3,200 more. So that's why I'm here today. You know, our kids deserve the best, and, we, and they, need, they need a, a school of funding that works. And this project already did work 20 years ago. It's time for a change now. I think Andy had done a good job. I think he went from the st all the way from Chicago to Carroll. I think he's done a good job with this. So all in all, Andy, I want to thank you for what you've done today. Thank you. I don't have any prepared remarks. John Sullivan, 47th uh, Senate District, Western Illinois. I had the distinction of having the largest Senate district in the state of Illinois, geography-wise. I have, I think, 36 school districts. Um, and so this issue is obviously very important to me. I think some of the previous speakers have outlined uh, why this is necessary. The current formula is obviously flawed. Uh, I believe all of my districts, um, I don't think any of them lose any money. Uh, so this, uh, and, and to me this really comes down to a fairness issue. I often talk about just one of the expenses that school districts have, and that's transportation. And when you have a lot of districts in, geogra in a rural district, transportation's a huge part of their budgets. And all of my school districts, you, each district can levy a tax up to a certain amount for transportation purposes. All of my districts are at the max. They've all levied the, uh, the most money, the, the highest tax levy that they can, and uh, because transportation is a huge, huge expense for them. Many of the districts that, some of the legislators that represent districts that, uh, um, uh, the, the legislators are opposed to this legislation, I think you should ask the districts, how, what, what amount of money are you levying, or what is, as far as your tax base and, and the amount of tax dollars that you receive from the local level? And Senator Stottleman talked about uh, the uh, EAVs and, uh, and those tax dollars that are coming in. You should ask them, what, how, are you levying your max, the maximum amount that you can to bring revenue into your district? I think most of them are going to say, no, we don't. Some districts don't levy any amount for transportation. So I think what this formula does, uh, what Senator Menard is trying to do, is to, uh, is to come up with a fair way of distributing dollars throughout the state of Illinois. And so uh, that's why I stand here uh, in support. Uh, I also want to thank Senator Menard for the amount of time and effort and work that he's put into this. It's just uh, unbelievable. So I appreciate, Andy, all the hard work you've done. Pat McGuire, State Senator, 43rd District, Joliet. Uh, Governor Rahner, in an address to the General Assembly earlier this year, spoke of two Illinois. Uh, he talked about the vibrant economy, the global attractiveness of Chicago, and then he talked about downstate cities, which have lost their minds, lost their factories. We're the downstate caucus. I also think of, it, think of us as the Rust Belt Caucus. So over the, over the more than three decades, cities like Joliet, Alton, Peoria, Rockford have lost much of their industrial base. Those kids need a boost. So this bill would, do, would address precisely the problem that Governor Rauner mentioned to the General Assembly. Downstate towns that used to be factory towns which have still not recovered from what the academics call deindustrialization, which began in the 80s and has continued to pace. Those kids need the boost to get the education required so they can get jobs in our 21st century economy. Thank you. James Claiborne of the 57th District. So I was looking around and realized I was the only one here in 1997. And actually then, uh, I don't know if most of the reporters remember, I sponsored the tax swap that at the time Governor Egger was pushing. Uh, it didn't make it out of the Senate committee. But I do want to say that this is a fundamental fairness and equitable issue that has existed uh, since I've been here, and since 1995. And, I commend uh, Andy Menard, Senator Menard, for taking on such a monumental task and making sure that there's fairness, uh, not based upon uh, the value of your home, but based upon the quality of education that all children uh, need and desire to be uh, able to be productive citizens. 
You know, I, I personally have been touched by this because over the last three and a half years, we've had to supplement uh, the school district in East St. Louis because of the value of the homes, because of the flight of companies and industry and small businesses in East St. Louis. And that's not fair to those children that uh, the businesses and their homes have been devalued and the businesses have left because they still deserve uh, the opportunity to be educated and be productive citizens. So, again, Andy, I, I commend you for your hard work and your commitment uh, to this issue. Anybody else? Okay, any questions? If it's as good as you say, how are you going to get it passed and signed in time? Well, we're going to keep working at it. We're going to keep working at it. Um, absent of change, three years from now, the system will erode further. It will be less equitable than it, than it is today. We have to measure that against what is a difficult choice for legislators uh, to put this change into motion. Uh, but we have to remember that absent of change, all of the problems that were just articulated here will be worse when whoever is occupying the seats that we occupy years from now are going to articulate at this podium. Um, this system is going to continue to erode. Uh, the system for downstate schools is eroding much faster than for other school districts in Illinois. And that has to be part of this discussion. I think that's why we have taken a position on this bill, because we've seen it firsthand. We've seen it with our own eyes. We see it every day in the schools that we represent. So it's without question a tough issue. It's uh, for many legislators a tough choice, but that has to be measured against the effect of the status quo where our state's going to be in a few years, absent of change. Andy, let me, there's been a lot, you've laid out a great case as far as why the current system is inequitable, based upon property values. It, it seems that the fly in the ointment, though, is after the first year of home harmless, there's going to be districts that have money taken away, and lawmakers don't want to pay from those districts where they're losing. Are, are you doing anything fundamentally different aside from just taking money from a district, if we're not basing it on property values, what are we basing it on that we're, what's the formula change that's going to make it more equitable? Well, we, because we, we value poverty in our formula as a priority for where resources should go. But I'm going to challenge your question, Terry. I'm going to challenge the question because I want everyone to understand that the guarantee in the bill today that sits before us in the state Senate for the wealthiest school districts in Illinois. There's a guarantee of funding for the wealthiest school districts in Illinois that none of our districts have had for more than a decade. So we are providing a piece of legislation that allows for a meaningful transition from the system that we own today to a new one that guarantees funding for the wealthiest school districts in Illinois and some of the wealthiest in the country. None of our districts have had that luxury for more than a decade. That has had an effect on the kids that we represent. And I would just point to where the governor uh, visited yesterday in Lyons Township High School, where a school district that is sitting on any bit, anywhere between 40 and $50 million of reserves. Governor Rauner uh, talks about education funding reform and cries foul at a bill uh, that would, in their words, four years from now, uh, send them about $1.8, $1.9 million less in state funding, which is a small percentage of their budget, as they sit on 40 to $50 million worth of reserves today. That is a tough set of words that I just put out, but that's the type of conversation we have to have in order to change the system that we have today. And, and I would just, again, urge Governor Rauner, he has a chance to lead, um, he is the statewide elected official in this building. All of us are elected from a district or a region of the state. Um, he is the one person that has the opportunity to lead on a statewide basis. It would, be, it would be good for this process if he pulled his chair up to the table and had this conversation with both Democrats and Republicans in the legislature. To date, he has not had that. Uh, and I've not had the opportunity to have those discussions. And I'm looking at some county numbers here for some members that could be considered part of the downstate caucus in Coles County, which is represented by Dale Ryder. I see two out of three schools would gain under the formula change in Fayette County, which I believe is Kyle McCarter's area. Um, I see that Vandalia, Ramsey, St. Elmo, Brownstown, 
would stand to uh, gain some money out of this. What are you saying to those members who are downstate like yourselves? Hey, I know it's tough. I know you're with the governor, but the numbers show your school districts would benefit from this. What are you trying to tell them? Hey, you know, I, I, I've said the same things consistently, and I think we all have, that, that you know, we have to recognize as uh, representatives and members representing Senate districts from downstate that, you know, what's happening in Senator Ryder's district is very similar to what's happening in, in my district, you know, or, or other members here uh, that, that have gathered today. So this ought not be a Democrat or Republican issue. This should be a conversation about how we change the system that has been, uh, you know, just uh, very difficult on, on downstate districts that have seen a growth in poverty unchecked, unchecked by state government. That has forced, uh, as previous speakers said, tax rates to rise. Some of the highest tax rates of school districts in Illinois are in downstate school districts because they have to continually go back to property taxpayers to make up for differences and cuts from state government, despite the fact that we all vote to put more money into the system. You know, many of the Republicans uh, have occupied seats in the Senate and have never voted for a school funding bill. Um, they have never voted to put more money into the system. We all do that. Uh, but yet our schools still get reductions, despite the fact that we put more money in. So this needs to be a broad conversation about what is happening to downstate schools on an annual basis. And we should remind ourselves, absent of change, uh, the situation is going to uh, further erode. The inequity gap is going to get greater. It's not going to fix itself just by default. I'm going to fight the perception or the argument that is continually being made that this would be a bailout for Chicago. That kind of argument obviously sells well in many more districts. Yeah, and, it, and it's being, um, you know, it's being uh, talked about on a daily basis uh, by uh, the Rauner administration, uh, which brings me to my point before. We need leadership from the governor on the issue. Uh, we don't need uh, individuals showing up on one side of the state pointing a finger at the other side of the state or vice versa, which happens all the time in this place. On this issue, we should be able to transcend that. Uh, Bernie, there are school districts in downstate Illinois that proportionally benefit to a much greater degree than Chicago Public Schools, not because it's a special deal for downstate. Nobody's saying that, are they? Nobody's saying, hey, Menard, your, your bill's a special deal for downstate Illinois, but there's any number of instances where school districts that are facing incredible financial circumstances a, a rise in poverty, lowering property values, a dangerous mix for a school district that received proportionally much greater benefit from this bill than sh the Chicago public school system. Um, you know, and we should remind ourselves that this would be one formula for the state. This isn't, you know, we're going to give Chicago uh, some uh, different set of rules to abide by than all of our districts in downstate. This is one set of rules for the entire state which we think is a step forward for our state system. What's the Rounder so, plan? How much money is the Rounder plan lose for Chicago? This is, this is a good example. This is a good example. Uh, I mentioned fully funding the foundation level, uh, so we're going to put $55 million more million in, which is what the governor suggested. That's going to earn Chicago Public Schools $78 million less. And uh, I, we had a town hall uh, on the south side last night, and uh, we talked about that. You know, and it doesn't make sense. So in a district that's struggling with finances that have high rates of poverty, how does putting $55 million in a fully funded foundation le level earn any district less money? A third of the districts lose money under the governor's proposal. Predominant number of those districts are downstate. Two-thirds of the kids in the state lose money under the governor's proposal. Those are things that we should debate. We have a better way to do this. How do you get over even just this battle with the numbers? I mean, it, even not getting into the politics and the actual formula, we have two sets of numbers floating around, one from yeah. the governor's office and one from yeah, the Yeah, and the, good question. And the, the most recent set of numbers shorts, um, shorts our bill $440 million. So we have to keep that in mind, too. Um, but what I, do you mean by that? So the, the numbers that were released, I believe, on Friday, uh, from the State Board of Education uh, don't account for $440 million in the system. So it artificially deflates under, your proposal. under Senate Bill 231, thank you. Um, artificially deflates what is represented on those, uh, on those pieces of paper. So, you know, I, I presume, by the way, I presume that every legislator makes good choices in the Senate. 
I, th I believe my colleagues do that. Um, what I said last week, what I'm going to say now is we just need to give the members of the General Assembly the, the correct information. You know, don't distribute information that is uh, on its face false, which is what happened from the Rauner administration last week. Uh, that was intended to confuse. It was intended to cloud what is already a difficult issue. But I would say this, arm legislators with the correct information so they can make good decisions on behalf of not just their districts, but the state as a whole. Like We're waiting. This is confusing stuff. Like, have the Republicans said, yeah, we, we, we buy your numbers over no. the ones that the administration that is our guy gave us? No, uh, you'd have to ask them. Senator, if can so. you address this argument from the governor about this whole effort is a red herring to hold up funding <laughs> from K-12 this fall? Well, you know, everybody here, um, everybody here voted for a an appropriation bill this time last year for schools. It was a clean appropriation bill. It wasn't, uh, there was nothing globbed onto it. It was a clean appropriation bill uh, that every Democrat voted for in the Senate and every Republican voted against. You should know, the morning that we took the vote on that bill, um, the governor called me and said, I'm gonna veto that bill. He threatened a veto of that bill. Um, we passed the bill anyway because it was a good balance uh, among needs of the districts of the state. I urged the governor to just take a pause, take a look at the bill, try to understand how we put it together, and give it full consideration. He ended up signing it. As you know, it was the only budget bill that the governor signed. I think he signed it for a good reason, because it was a good approach to not rubber stamping the status quo. So fast forward to February, the governor puts a budget out on the table erases all of that work, the work that he embraced with his signature, and goes back to the way things were prior to that bill. So he erases the work that was done by our caucus and the House Democratic Caucus and reverts back to a system that was, uh, that was in place before we took those small steps in that bill. Um, and then he gives us a lecture in the House, you know, and he used the word cynical, uh, cynical attempts to reform schools. Um, and this doesn't get us to where we need to go. Uh, we have evidence that we can do exactly what he's asking us to do. And it's evidenced by the fact that he signed that bill last year. So there's no attempt to hold anything hostage. There's no attempt to hold anything up. We're simply saying that the time has come for us to take these steps once and for all. We have plenty of time to do both. And if the governor pulled his chair up to the table, we could get it done. Would you support a K-12 education? Well, it, yes, I would. Um, but keep in mind, you know, the bill that we're sponsoring, 231, that we're here to talk about is not a budget bill. It's, it's a bill that directs how money is distributed. It's the formula. So whether or not you put a lot of money into the system or, or you don't, that's an appropriation question. How you distribute it makes a big difference. And, Less and, and many of us represent uh, universities and community yep. colleges. And we feel that that's very important as well as far as when you talk about education. It's early childhood. It's K through 12. It's also higher education. Yep. In addition yeah. to the regional and party differences on this issue, there's also there also seems to be a difference between the two chambers. Some of your House Democratic colleagues were in there this morning with superintendents from the Quad Cities, Street, or other areas of the state, um, and they didn't, you know, they were jumping on board to endorse this plan. What's it going to take if you guys can get it out of the Senate to win win support on? Well, it takes two chambers to to pass a bill, and it takes a governor to sign a bill to make it the law. Uh, this is the first step in the process in the Senate. I fully expect the House to weigh in on the issue. They've had you know, uh, well over a dozen hearings at this point. Most recent was last week. Um, they've had at least one per week, I think all spring, to their credit. Uh, they've, they've dove into this issue uh, to a, a greater degree than I think many of us expected this spring, so I would fully expect the House to have its own proposal. That's lawmaking, and then we have to come together to get a bill passed uh, that ultimately the governor can sign. Republicans in the House and Senate, though, are saying, let's pass a clean education bill and work on this later. They say there's got to be a way that we can figure out that people aren't losing money. They should look at the roll call from last year. But you've worked We're, on this. They all voted no. But you've worked on this for so long. So even if we put off the formula, is there a way to make the formula where there are no losers? That's the bill we have today. Um, we're the only, uh, we have the only plan that guarantees a level of funding for four years. The only plan that exists today that guarantees a level of funding for four years for every school district in Illinois is contained in Senate Bill 231. 
I would remind everyone that we had two previous plans that were cost neutral, that were rejected on their face by the conservatives in the Senate. Uh, they, could, they rejected the cost neutral bills. So we came up with a plan that would hold districts harmless that has a price tag associated with it. So I, I, would, uh, I would just say this, um, we have the only plan that will guarantee a level of funding for school districts for four years, which would bring certainty to a system that has had no certainty in recent years. Why are you running it? Yeah, and we'll wrap it up. I don't know. Subject to the schedule of the Senate. You still have no suggested uh, funding sources, are correct? No. Um, and I, I would say this is where we agree with the governor. This is a place where we agree. He says this is the most important thing that we do as a state government. I, hap I don't speak for everyone here. I happen to agree with that. So we would, I would say start here. Start here with this bill, and let's craft a budget okay, around is it. Is the governor still calling you? He said he called you last year. Uh, he did last year, yes. <laughs> what happened yeah. after four years, Andy? After four years, uh, we would, uh, the bill would say you take a look at the landscape. You reassess it. Uh, we don't go 20 years without some type of look at the formula and its effect. It's, there are built-in benchmarks to meet, um, which would force the legislature to take the issue up again. Does that prevent outdated Absolutely. Outdated? Absolutely. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, man. Good job.